see everybody. I, this is my second speech of the day, so I'm almost, almost sick of myself. Although in this business, I suppose that's, you're not allowed to get sick of your own voice. So, you start a business, like me, like all of you. Probably if you've started a business, you are the best person in sales in your company because you couldn't possibly even get your second employee if you couldn't get a first client. So, you're, so you started a business, you realize that you're really good at selling. That's your gift. If you started a business and you're not really good at selling, then I really hope you found a partner. So here you are, you go through what I would call this kind of do I have a business phase. And you go, you know, this, this, you were talking about a baby. So now you're past being a baby and now you're into a, a child. And so you have a, you, you've, you've gone past this viability stage and you have this business and it's you bringing in all the clients and then all these other wonderful people that you have underneath you that are doing the work. Initially, it's you selling and doing the work. Then it's you selling and everybody else doing the work. That's where the story begins. Now what? So if you're like me, I'm not sure, you know, I, I'm, I'm constantly thinking about, okay, well, how do I get the business to the next level? Or how do I get the business ready for the next generation? Or how do I work the proverbial on the business instead of in the business? Or how do I create a legacy? Or how do I stop being the only one that knows how to sell in this company? Because without somebody else figuring out how to, how to do it, you're effectively stuck. You know, I remember dating a girl a long time ago and her father was a lawyer. I mean, he was an accountant and he would work six and a half days a week. And I said, you know, there's got to be more to living than six and a half days a week of, of working. And he said, well, if I don't do it, there's nobody else that can manage our clients. There's nobody else that can bring in clients. There's nobody else that can do what I can do. And I thought to myself, I was 21 at the, I just thought to myself, how can I avoid this scenario as quickly as possible? So that's me. I started, this is my second business. I too, like many of you, come from a line of family businesses. My great-grandfather arrived in, in Cape Town, South Africa and started, a, uh, and started a business and then they had nine children of which one of them was my grandfather and that was, they were involved in that business and then my father spun off and started his own business. Then apartheid came, we ran to Canada. My father then continued to start his own business. My, my middle brother Anton has one of the, the world's largest toy companies called Spin Master Toys which I'm sure many of you have given your, your money to us. Thank you very much for all your children. My father now works for my brother. Talk about dynamics. Um, and so and my, other, my eldest brother is an entrepreneur, and I'm an entrepreneur, so we're all, we're, we're all crazy to start our own businesses. So here we are in this scenario, and now we need to build a, a duplicatable, sustainable sales organization that can create sales, not just wait for the phone to ring. Right? At some point, the notion that your own goodwill, your networking abilities, all the relationships you've had and built into the community, all that kind of stuff is only going to get you to a certain point. At some point, someone else is going to have to carry that torch. Right? What, I want to talk, what I want to encourage you is don't wait till you're planning your exit before you start thinking about this. Also, don't wait until your business is in trouble before you start thinking about this. It, the best time to start thinking about this is when your business is doing okay or better. Why? Because you have the time to naturally go through the development cycle of finding people that can become your legacy. It's funny. We, we talk about this whole idea of, you know, I call my presentation manufacturing a sale. I mean, manufacturing is like salt and, you know, on one side, or oil and vinegar, as you, as you think about it as it compares to sales. So, I, you know, I want to bring them together, and I want you to understand that you, you do have the ability to create sales without relying on somebody with your last name and specifically yourself. So how do we do that? Well, let's look. The traditional sales department was all about the people. If, as long as you hired a bunch of good salespeople, you were okay. One of the things I hear consistently from the companies that I work with is, okay, so we ran this business, I was a salesperson, I was a salesperson, I was a salesperson, and I eventually realized that I needed to get somebody else to do this. So I started hiring some salespeople, of which I fired each one, one at a time. Gone through them like, Okay, and I'm sure some of you in the room have been through that, through that scenario where you've literally just gone through salespeople, okay? Traditional sales organization is very dependent on just a, key, on just a few key salespeople. And these salespeople are responsible for doing everything. So they're responsible for, hello, my name is all the way to give me your money and everything in between. Now, you as an individual may be good at that. You may be 
one of that very small percentage of people, like I would like to suggest, think that I am in that, that has the ability to be good at all facets of the sale. But let's be honest. Most people are not like that. Most people are good at something in sp specific. Some people are better hunters. Some people are better farmers. Some people are better openers. Some people are better closers. Some people are better at small business. Some people are better at big business. Some people are better at relationships. Some people are better technical. That was fast. Wow, I said that quickly. So I want you to think about another way. And you know, if we were to get together back and think about, OK, well, here we are. We're the brains of our company. We're all the major shareholders. And we want to think about how to increase sales. The typical three approaches that we would go with was change reps. Oh, Johnny and Susie aren't doing so well. Let's call them out, get some new people. Ad reps. Oh, you know, we do $10 million a year. At a, uh, when 10 sales reps, if I add on two, we'll end up doing, through osmosis, $12 million. Or train reps. Nothing wrong with those three strategies. All I want to suggest to you is that they're not the only options that you have available to you. The, there are some high risks with those strategies, although saying that everything I'm going to show you has risks. Everything has risks. Nothing's a guarantee. But, you know, traditionally when I do this workshop, which is over about four hours, I ask people, you know, so, you know, how long does it take for a sales rep to be a revenue taker, a revenue maker instead of a revenue taker? At least, how long till they get to that break-even point where the amount of money that they're generating for you is equal to the amount of money you're giving them? The answer is somewhere between 6 and 18 months, depending on what you sell. Obviously, if you're giving somebody an established territory, they're ability to deliver a return will be faster. If you're, if you're standing out to the middle of Saskatchewan and they're starting from scratch, then of course that will take a lot longer. But if you go with a year, that's not a bad number. So you may not know for a year if changing reps, adding reps, or training reps worked. All you know is that you're a year older, in my case a year grayer. The, so there's obviously turnover, there's cost implications, Long learning curve, and again, it's hard to hire, especially if you are in a business that is not 100% clear, easy to understand product. Because how do you find someone? If I'm looking for somebody that, is, that knows everything from hello my name is all the way to give me your money and everything in between, first, it's really hard to find that person. And when you do, they're probably your competition soon. Right? They can become your competitor. And especially in the services world like I live in, it's unreasonable to think that you're going to, that your number one strategy for growing your sales organization is to find people exactly like you. If that's your strategy, good luck. It's a tough, tough strategy. And what ends up happening is you end up hiring people and firing and hiring and firing and hiring and firing and the cycle just keeps going on and on. So there's a new kind of way of thinking about, it's about thinking of divide and conquer, about how to take your sales organization and divide it up into components. I referred to some of those components before, hunter versus farming, big business versus small, commodity versus capital, opening versus closing. There's a lot of options. You know, if you asked a doctor 75 years ago what they did for a living, you met them at a party, they tell you they were a doctor. If you, if you ask a doctor today what he does for a living, he's some kind of autologist. Right? Everybody's a specialist. Nobody says that they're a doctor. Probably the person who says they're a doctor probably isn't a doctor. They're using it as a one-liner. Everybody is a specialist. Sales is kind of the final frontier. It's kind of the last thing that we think about and say to ourselves, well, you're not just simply pre-wired to know every single thing about sales. How do we, how do we figure your specialty? And we, what we really want to do is try create sales. Now think of the word create, not waiting under, not waiting under an apple tree with a bag open waiting for apples to fall in, but actually learning how to shake the apple tree so that apples can fall down. The ability to not simply wait for the phone to ring, okay? And for those of you, think about your cultures and the way you sell. Do you create sales or do sales just kind of happen? Now, as long as if they do just kind of happen, as long as that what, it's enough to keep the funnel full, then you're good. But there, there, sometimes there's enough rain that you don't have to go water your garden, isn't there? Sometimes there's not. Your business model should be to be able to make sure you can create rain without having to simply wait for it to come from the heavens. Right? I don't know about you, but that's the only way that I can sleep at night. Right? My dream is not to work 90 hours a week and drop dead at my desk. That's not my dream. It might be yours. I don't know. We do not share the same dream. Okay, so I want you to think about running sales like another department. Process, tools, technology, people. Right, right you know, We've, 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 we've boxed up all of our other departments, procurement, 
administration, finance, manufacturing, distribution. You can look at it and say, there's no one department in your company that's only about the people. That you would say the people are the best part, but they're not the only part. There's going to be other things you have in play that enable you to create whatever it is you're creating or facilitate whatever you're trying to facilitate in that department. But for some reason, sales is kind of the final frontier. It's still, oh, well, you know, the only person that knows how to sell in this company is me. Well, hopefully I can change that for you. I want you to think about how to grow sales without just adding more feet on the street. It is very expensive to just simply keep hiring and hiring and hiring and hiring salespeople. Okay, it doesn't matter what your business is. So, there's a bunch of components. We're not going to go through every one of them because time just simply won't allow me. I'm probably at 30 seconds left. Um, but here are a bunch of variables. You'll notice that good sales reps is the, is the only one that's in blue. What I'm saying is that's not the only ingredient. That's the one that we all go for. When I meet people, I say, what are you going to do? You're 60 years old. You want to start planning your exit, or you want to start working on the business more, or you want to go on that vacation you've been promising your spouse for umpteen amounts of time that you just can't seem to get out the front door. What are you going to do to build, to bubba gum shrimpify your boat? Pardon the cheesiness of that, of that analogy. And they keep saying, I just got to find good salespeople. And I say to them, well, you know, this, you know, sit down. Let's have, let's have a chat. Think about process or process, depending on the side of Mississauga you're from. That's our Mississippi, right? Process is your recipe of how to create sales. Technology, CRM, a consistently full pipeline. Whose responsibility is to make, your funnel, make sure your funnel's always full? If it's your salesperson's responsibility, when they're filling the funnel, guess what they're not doing? Selling. When they're selling, guess what they're not doing? Filling the funnel. And the longer your sales cycle, the more painful that or the more obvious that will become. If it takes you three months to, to, bring in a, to reel in a fish, how many lines are in the water while you're, while you're reeling them in? Zero. Sales resource allocation. The notion that not everybody should do everything. Not everybody should be hired to, do every, to talk to every audience, both existing customer and prospect, every size, every geography, every product, everything. That the idea that we can divide and conquer, and I'm going to show you a few models. Comp model, not going to touch upon. Understanding what is your perfect customer. Being a snob is the best thing you can do in helping you understand how to really isolate the kind of markets to go after. You know, there are people in here, I'm sure, because everywhere I speak, there's always financial people in the room. And I say, you know, if I say, what's your, what's your market? They're not going to tell me people with money. They're going to be much, much sharper than that. And if you did tell me people with money, you're going to spend a lot of time wasted trying to figure out who is your perfect, your perfect audience. Quoting process. I sometimes spend on upwards of half an hour on that subject because I, I look at so many companies and all they have is a, a catalog, or in this nowadays, an Excel spreadsheet full of quotes that have been sent out and never followed up. Think about that. You know, I was speaking this morning at a, at, at a trade show and I told them that over 80% of leads from trade shows don't get followed up. 80%. So you go to the grocery store with a $100 bill, you go buy $100 worth of groceries. Before you walk in the front door, you throw $80 in the garbage, you put your pantry and your fridge worth $20 worth of food. Then you run out of food very, very quickly, and you go back to the grocery store and spend another $100. Sounds a little ridiculous. Same thing happens with quotes. We just keep on vomiting out quotes all day long. You want a quote? Here's a quote. Want a quote? Here's a quote. Want a quote? Here's a quote. You think that quoting is selling. Quoting is just simply a documented affirmation of what you've discussed. Okay, if they didn't like, I have an expression, if they don't like it out of your mouth, they're not going to like it on paper. Simple as that. Good sales reps, we're going to leave, we're going to leave consistent training. Do I believe in training? Of course I believe in training. It's just a line item. And strong leadership. This whole notion of who should be the sales manager. We're, unfortunately, we're not going to cover everything today. I'm already down to five. Wow, that's awful. Okay, so now I'm going to go through, I'm going to go through Four quick models, apparently quicker than I planned, of four different sales models that I'd like you to think about. This first one is where you have one team responsible for generating leads, managing those leads, nurturing those leads, and following up through the sales cycle to the point where you now have a need. When you have that need, you pass it to the sales team. The sales team's responsibility is to consult, quote, and close that. When you do, once that first sale is made, you pass it to an account management team who's responsible for executing that project and then subsequently selling more to that existing customer. So that is a three-pronged approach. If you sell capital goods where the typical customer is going to buy one thing and then you're not going to hear from them for 10 years, this model doesn't make sense because there's not a lot to count manage. But 
if you're in a business where you're constantly have opportunities to sell to your customers, if you've got somebody who has a gift of creating brand new relationships from scratch, do not put them in front of existing customers to keep on selling to because you're not maximizing their gift. Right? My gift is new. That's what I need to spend my time doing. Let me show you another option. Another option is an abbreviated version of the first option. That's just simply a lead generator, a business developer, whatever you want to call them, whose responsibility is to generate leads, nurture leads, work that front half of the funnel, which again, if you're in a business like mine that has a six month sales cycle, that's a lot of work. It's not just hold up a shingle, wait for someone to walk in like, a, like in a used car dealership. And then you have the sales team who consults, quotes, and closes that first sale and then manages the customer ongoing and then continues to sell to them. Third option. The third option is your classic hunter-farmer model. Some people responsible for opening new doors, some people responsible for managing those existing relationships. Now, I'll tell you, in my company, we're probably the smallest company in the room. We do about a million and a half bucks a year. And, and even with a company so small, we actually employ that model. So people are sitting there thinking, wow, Darren is talking about ideas that are so great for big businesses. Not true. I started this whole duplicate Darren strategy right when I started, right when I started my business as quick, as soon as I had my first um, enough money to be able to afford that. Okay? So to begin the process of not dropping dead at my desk after 90 hours of, of working. A fourth model I'd like to quickly show you. So a fourth model takes the same principles of prospect versus active customer versus inactive customers, which you would have seen before, but it takes into consideration big, medium, and small type of audiences. So if I were to hire Jeremy, and Jeremy was a young whippersnapper with a great canvassing character but didn't know nothing about my business, I would give him the C prospects because it's the safest environment for him to cut his teeth. If I'm trying to remove myself out of selling, what I wanted, and, but my natural skill is hunting, and I'm a, big, I'm a good at big whale hunting, I'm going to give myself A prospects. If I hire someone who's an in industry veteran who's phenomenal, knows everything about the business, but doesn't feel comfortable creating a relationship from scratch, I'm going to give them my A and B active customers. So you can think about the fact that I'm trying to show you some examples of how you can divide and conquer more than just Oh, you're hired to do everything, go good, good luck with that. Oh, you didn't bring in any results in six months, you're fired. So, unfortunately, we're not going to get a much chance to cover that, so we're going to skip over that. I'm down to two minutes. Yes, I know. Don't, don't worry. I will, I will behave. Not one of my strengths, but I will try. Other topics to consider, which again would be topics that I would normally go much deeper into. Sales process is another line item. What is the sales process? Why bother? How to build it? How to use it? The bottom line is think of a sales process as a recipe book. There are a bazillion recipes for chocolate chip cookies. If you want to get in the chocolate chip cookie manufacturing business, you got to pick one and you got to make sure that everybody in your team is making the same cookies. Same as selling. There's a bazillion and one ways to sell. Just get together and agree on the recipe for selling. It is not a script. That's key. Quoting, we talked about that. When, when not to, how, following up, what should your close ratio be? CRM, think of the benefits of, of a CRM as the same benefits as an ERP to, to, to your manufacturing environment or financial software you know, into that department. It is just a shared, intelligent filing cabinet. Think about what happens every time salespeople turn over at a greater rate than almost any other occupation. Think about all that information that's sitting in their heads and in their Blackberries, probably not Blackberry soon, in their heads and in whatever that company will be called, and that just walks out the door. How do you measure, manage, track, support, coach, guide someone whose entire world, other than quoting and selling, is just simply sitting in their head or on sheets of paper or in their Outlook or on fold file folders? And then sales management philosophy. Think about what is the role of a sales manager. Please, whatever you do, do not take your number one sales rep and take him off the road, put him behind a desk and have him be the sales manager. Right, as demonstrated, Wayne Gretzky, fabulous hockey player, terrible coach. Right, look at all the coaches in the, in the, in the NHL today. Almost none of them were, good, were, were the top tier person on their, you know, in the game. They had the empathy for what it feels like to toil back and forth between the minors and the majors, right? That's so the typical two rules of sales management is do not take the, the number one salesperson off the road and make them a sales manager. Number two, preferably if you can afford it, do not have your sales manager also be selling. Okay? Because you have a little bit of a conflict of interest. Think about it. Do I help you or do I make a sale? Hmm. If I'm compensated to make a sale, I'm probably not going to help you. 
All right. The, the, purpose, the purpose of a sales manager is no different than the purpose of being a parent. Your job is to develop your future. So if you're constantly just selling yourself, how much time are you spending developing your future? Okay, so that is the philosophy behind sales management in the sense of I want you to sit down and say, not, oh, you didn't do very well, you, you, you know, you're fired, to what's your plan this quarter in order to be successful? Plan your work, work your plan. Not just hope, think, cross your fingers, and then when they don't do well, fire them. You know, you may know, like I know, innately, how many calls I need to make, how many contacts I need to make, how many opportunities I need to be in my funnel, how many quotes I need to make, what my close ratio needs to be. But your, 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 your team doesn't know that innately. Your job is to break it down, reverse engineer, help them understand what are the quantitative and qualitative components that if they do it every week, don't worry, nine months the sales will be there, right? You cannot, you cannot just focus on, on, on picking the, the, the fruits and vegetables when you've only just put the seed in the ground. There's a bunch of sequences and steps that you can manage and monitor that would give you an, an inclination that you're on track. That is the purpose of a sales manager, to help somebody understand, to be able to plan their work, work the plan, celebrate the success, modify the challenges, and then ensure we achieve that beyond just, because uh, I ask salespeople all the time, what's your, what's your plan? I've, I've been given a $2 million uh, quota, and if I need help, I, I just go ask for it. That is going to work for a very small percentage of people. Most people, even professionals. There's a goaltending coach in the NHL. You'd think if you made it to the NHL, you know how to, you know how to be a goaltender. But we're still developing those people. So your job as a sales manager is to develop your people. So in conclusion, which is the fastest 20 minutes of my life, I'm probably at 22 minutes and I'm going to be thrown at something soon. No matter what the economic situation is, I want you to understand that you are in control. You're in control of all those different line items I, sent, I, I showed you on that circle. You're in control of your process and your strategy and your pipeline and your compensation and your training and your recruitment efforts and your, and your CRM and, your, you know, and how you divide up the sales organization. You can't just say, oh, well, the world isn't buying. It's 2008. You know, we're just going to fire everybody, hunker down, and, you know, and, and hope the wind passes. Ooh, how did I get there? How did that happen? Nobody told me. It's not, it's not nice. We're supposed to be a team. There's never been a better time to rethink your business. Why? Because it's, it's the best time to think your business when your business is doing okay or better. Not when you're, you know, six feet from, from the bottom of the ocean. All right? At that time when people say, my business is in real trouble, what should I do? I say, given the length of your sales cycle, paddle harder. That's all I can suggest for you at this point. All right? Because there's, there's no strategy behind that. Hiring the right salespeople to do everything is hard to duplicate, so divide and conquer. I showed you four options today. There are many, many, many other options, many extrapolations upon those themes. I'm happy to kick around lots of ideas with you. Create a sales organization with clear objective structure, tools, and resources. Utilize technology to create transparency and co of communication flow. Do not let all your customers' world, I mean, relationships and words just walk out the streets when that salesperson moves to your competitor. Being a small company is not a hurdle. It's, in fact, the greatest blessing. blessing. Set, the, set the foundation and the culture while you're three people, not try change it when you're 300. Right? It's a lot easier to turn a tugboat than it is to turn a steamship. And if you do not know how to do this, of course, get help. Wow, that was exhausting. <laughs> so, thank you very, very much. At the end of the day, I want to just bring it all together and, and say, for those of you that have founded your own businesses, you're looking or you think back to your father or your, or your, or, or your other, uh, you know, the, your past and people that were starting their own business and you looked at them and say, they were the only person that knew how to make a sale and there's a risk in that, right? Whether it's going to be your children that are going to be part of your legacy or in my case, I hope that nobody gets in my business and I just sell it to somebody and, and make lots of money and sail off into the sunset. No one's going to buy my business if I'm the only one who knows how to bring in clients. My business is going to be worth nothing. That's, that's, what, that's what keeps me motivated to, de to de darinify my business on a consistent basis. All right? So with that in mind, thank you all very, very much, and I hope the next 15 games for the Leafs are another 10 and 5.